appears before the Lord Jesus Christ comes to take away the church. And he were to bring about a false impression of what many believers feel to be the rapture of the church. It's very possible, according to my guest tonight, that you, if you are looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come, that you may fall for the line of Antichrist, thinking that he has come, that he has come to gather the church together and make all kinds of promises. Antichrist tricking the Christians who are looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come in rapture. My guest tonight is Dr. Arnold Murray, host of the Shepherd's Chapel television broadcast seen on the National Christian Network twice a day. We're going to talk about this false impression that many believers have known as the rapture of the church and the coming Antichrist. What does it mean if you're looking for the Lord to come? Is it possible you could be tricked? Could the very elect of Jesus Christ be deceived? We're going to open up this subject tonight along with a couple of others and we're going to talk about Bible prophecy. Just where do we stand in God's timetable? My guest tonight, Dr. Arnold Murray, Bible teacher and host of the Shepherd's Chapel broadcast. We're going to talk about this interesting stand that Dr. Murray has, and we're going to invite you to participate in our program a little later on. Stay with us as we talk about the coming Antichrist, and will you be deceived? Stay tuned. From the studios of NCN, welcome to Amazing Grace. Featuring guests from all areas of the body of Christ, ministering both in word and song. Join with us as we discover how God honors the faith and trust of His people who are saved by His amazing grace. And you can unite with us via our special 800 number to share God's grace. And now, here's the founder and president of the National Christian Network, Ray Cassis. We have a guest tonight who is on the air on the National Christian Network, one hour a day, Monday through Friday, two half-hour teaching programs. You can see the Shepherd's Chapel broadcast. And whenever I do an open, amazing grace program, I get some calls and some reaction and some input from those of our viewers who either like what they hear and see on Shepherd's Chapel uh, or dislike what they hear and see. And uh, I, think, I think that's pretty healthy, uh, Dr. Murray, to have these kinds of... Uh, of responses. So oh, welcome yes. to our broadcast. Uh, thank you. It's, it's a, pl a privilege and a pleasure being here, Ray. And I just, if I could just take a second. Sure. Say, after viewing and uh, visiting the headquarters for NCN today, I'm very impressed. And I just thank God for the work that you and your crew, you could just feel the spirit of God, which is unusual. It seems some networks commercialize away. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're all sincere in serving the Lord. And I just encourage people everywhere to support by writing their cable companies and stating we would like to have NCN own or to stay on. And we sure. just, I just feel the spirit here and I feel at home. Amen. Well, we're glad to have you and glad to give uh, opportunity for some of our viewers to call in and, and respond. You're, you've been teaching now for quite a few months. Almost a year now. Almost a year. It's, we've met a lot of wonderful friends and... Uh, uh, the word can be controversial. Mm -hmm. I think primarily because there have been probably, well, there's never enough evangelists, but I blame it on the teachers, which my calling is as a teacher. Mm -hmm. The teachers have not picked up after that first step was created by the evangelist, of course, Holy Spirit ultimately, but followed through by the teacher to give each student meat so that they could stand and understand the full Word of God. Mm -hmm. In a sense, this is why Christ groaned many times in prayer, in teaching the disciples. He was disappointed yeah. because they could not overall see, and he kept using the term, have you not read? Right. Because it was written. Now, you go through the Bible step by step, line upon line, precept upon precept. Do you have a starting place and an ending place? How do you how do, you do your telecast? Really, um, we... Uh, try to share equally between Old and New Testament, or we could say as the Father leads. 
uh, with a sprinkling of prophecy. I feel that prophecy in as much as definitely we are in the end times. There's no doubt, I think no one would argue with that point, mm -hmm. that prophecy becomes paramount because the prophets of the Old Testament, as it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 10 and 11, Paul stated these events happen to them as an ensample to us to show us how it's going to be. Yeah. So it is important to study all. Well, we're going to talk a little about tonight about some of your controversial all right. uh, positions. All right. Uh, let's, what is your message to those Christians, those believers, who are looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come, who are caught up with the idea that the rapture is going to take place at any time, and uh, uh, what is your message to them? My message is the same message Christ taught when he was asked by the disciples, when? When is it going to be? How is it going to happen? How is the end of this age going to come to pass? And Christ <clears throat> excuse me, gave seven events. In Matthew 24, they're repeated in Mark 13 and Luke 21 mm -hmm. of exactly how it would come to pass. Number one, he said, see that no one deceives you. For Antichrist shall come. Not maybe, but he will come. Come before he comes. Right. He states, even if it were possible, mm -hmm. the elect would be deceived. But he has shortened the three and a half year period to five months. Of course, I draw that from the book of Revelation. Now, you, he's, he has shortened the three and a half year period of what? Tribulation? Of tribulation of Antichrist. Not God's great day of tribulation. Okay. But the tribulation of the Antichrist. You actually teach two tribulations. Yes. Maybe you could, maybe before we get into the, let, let's, let's take where we are now in, in God's timetable. What will take place, if you kind of give us a thumbnail sketch of, 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 the, of the plan of God in relationship to the church in these end days? Surely. Okay. I'd be happy to, Ray. Okay. Jesus, his foremost warning was, in that 24th chapter of Matthew, when you see... The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, then you won't even have time hardly to get out of Jerusalem. Actually giving the key point and the location as to where the first sign would appear. Now, when you go to the book of Daniel, as Christ instructed, not as I would say or you would say, but as Christ instructed, we see today in that 11th chapter, number one, Daniel spoke of, if you check it in your Hebrew manuscripts, the desolator. This is why Dr. Moffat in his translation says, standing where he ought not. Hmm. Do you see? The scholar has no reason whatsoever to assume that it is a desolation when the point Christ told you to go to is desolator. Huh? So, uh, in other words, this is where the confusion begins. Mm -hmm. Now, also in this very same chapter, um, speaking of chapter 11, we see a... Uh, again, as Paul stated, these things happened as a sa an example to us. Mm -hmm. Daniel, in the 10th chapter, was standing by the river Tigris. Uh, and he observed uh, the king of the north and the king of the south called this because of their geographical location from Jerusalem, being the point. Okay. Now, the prince of Persia, in a satanic sense, approached and Michael had to assist Gabriel to even come through. Now, Persia of that time is Iran of today. Hmm. And as you see, these end times transpire. The king of the north being Khomeini. Uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini. Ayatollah Khomeini. And what I'm saying, this is supposition. Now, it's something Christians should be watching because Christ said, go there and learn of it. So today, we see the king of the north uh, as Khomeini. Many people do not realize how, how e Egypt, of course, being the uh, king of the south, how deep they are into the peace uh, treaty or proposals placed forth by Iraq at this time. Hmm. Uh, Khomeini, or that is to say Iran, more or less has the support of Syria and also Libya, um, Lebanon today because uh, 
Syria more or less controls Lebanon. Mm -hmm. And it states how that uh, uh, if you pick up in the fifth verse of that 11th chapter, and we're, we're plowing a little deep now, right? Yeah, we're well, going in. Right, sure. Okay. But as we pick up in that fifth verse, which was prophecy yet history, we see two kings very close, the king of the north and the king of the south very close, but a woman causes um, dissension, and actually the woman was Beatrice in history, and she killed many children. And we see today that this woman is symbolized by the Islamic religion, who which is a religion that they claim their founder was Abraham. They believe in one God. They feel that Jesus Christ is the Word. And Christians should be watching because if you do not understand the religions in the Middle East, you cannot ascertain what's actually happening there. Mm -hmm. But then we see, as the scriptures uh, quote, uh, that the Shah, let's say in Sadat, if you pick it up there, mm -hmm. um, and of course I I'm, I'm probably should not have entered into this because it's going to leave a, a lot uh, wanting because of groundwork laid to it. Right. But we see, in fact, according to Scripture, I believe that the King of the North, which is I Iran, will overcome Iraq. And then trouble will be back home through religion itself. And he will turn there and fall. And then immediately after this, you want to be very careful because Antichrist shall come. Antichrist is taught commonly by man is a man that appears among people. It is not. Antichrist, why did was Satan given so many names by God, even as Christ was in a sense, Savior, Comforter, etc., etc.? Mm -hmm. Because there are roles, Ray. There are roles that they play in God's Word. He, that's the key. Lucifer, Satan, the dragon, the devil, etc. He is also Antichrist, and chapter 12 in the book of uh, Revelation makes it very clear that he will be cast out upon this earth, that he will enter peacefully and prosperously, and it is he that shall take over. Uh, if the supposition were to be correct, as I said, that's not prophecy, it's supposition. It's interesting to study prophecy if you keep attuned to current events as they transpire. Okay. You see basically two tribulation periods. Will one last approximately five months? Yes. When will it begin? No one knows the exact moment that it shall begin. It will begin the day Antichrist sets his foot upon the earth. Okay. How, how, let me qualify that just a little bit, if I may. Christ, in this 24th chapter of Matthew we were discussing, said, For the elect's sake, I have shortened the days. Now, when Christ says he's going to do something, he does it. He produces. That's why the religious community was so jealous of him when he walked the earth. He produces. Mm -hmm. He makes it very clear in the ninth chapter of Revelation that that five-month period will be the time of the locust, which has a direct relationship to the locust army spoken of in the book of Job. Mm -hmm. That would come from the north, etc. But uh, he gives us there the key as to how long it shall be. And the, the fascinating thing is that Jesus uses nature to deliver a message. The locust in that longitude and latitude of Jerusalem is May through September a five-month period, actually, that they live in that stage. Mm -hmm. Of course, taking it to approximately the Feast of Trumpets being the final trump. So every time we roll around to a May, you feel that at least we're another year away from tribulation. Uh, I say region. that a person should be awake always. always. That, uh, we should not be a child of night, that is to say sleep, that we are a child of light, and even as God lengthened the day for Joshua, to have the victory he has for us in Christ. We know it's a five-month period, and he has likened it to that. I feel more than likely it will happen during those months. What is the second uh, tribulation, that, and how long is it? The second tribulation could last 15 minutes. Hmm. The second tribulation is the tribulation brought on by the God Almighty. And Ray, it is ironic that more Christians do not realize it, but the seven events that I told you that Christ shared with the disciples are the seven seals, which mm -hmm. are identical to the seven trumps. Mm -hmm. Exactly in order, no one is hurt with anything other than deception and lies until the seventh trump which is when God destroys his enemies. Mm -hmm. There will be two geographical locations, I feel, that will be involved in that. 
God will not harm his children, but he will uh, destroy the enemy. That tribulation, certainly, there's going to be a gathering together back to him the instant that the two witnesses rise from the street in Jerusalem mm -hmm. after they have lain there a literal three and a half days. Mm -hmm. There will... Um, they will be um, witnessing, and many people that here even now will have already been deceived by Antichrist, thinking that he is Christ mm -hmm. and following him. Well, you know, your position, Dr. Murray, is, is certainly in opposition to uh, uh, most evangelical Christian believers today. I realize that. And, um, uh, in fact, uh, most, most uh, look at the 70th week of Daniel uh, as, uh, as literally a seven-year period. Yes. And uh, three and a half years of false peace and three and a mm -hmm. half years of tribulation, mm -hmm. heavy tribulation. Mm -hmm. um, but you, of course, reject all of that. And that's I don't reject it. I only look at it a little different way because of what the Hebrew declares of the 70th week. Mm -hmm. There is a seven-year period, but the first three and a half years of that are by a political system. Antichrist never appeared in Daniel's uh, prophecy until the middle of the week when the daily sacrifice was taken away. And then he was to have three and a half years. The two witnesses were to have the identical same time, 1260 days. That gives the positive and the negative. However, God allowed, in as much as all prophecy given in days is of God. All prophecy given in months, which is moons, is satanic. It is of Satan okay. and concerns him. Will there be a rapture? There will be a gathering back to Christ. I, I dislike the word rapture being used uh, as far as Christ's coming is concerned. Number one, it is not in God's word. It is a, it is a tradition set forth by man and it's going to deceive man. What do you think of the, of the word uh, or the scriptures that, uh, that say that the catching away of the elect in Christ? The catching away of the elect in Christ shall take place. But it will be when the two witnesses rise from the street. Otherwise, until then. Prior to the start of millennium. Right. At, at the, the end of tribulation. At the, at the end, end of the two at, tribulation. At period. the end of the tribulation of Antichrist and at the beginning of the great tribulation. That's why I said that tribulation will last 15 minutes. It's amazing, Ray, some evangelists and ministers are saying there's going to be a holocaust and a terrible atomic explosion. Mm -hmm. God created this earth in purity. It's man that destroys it. Uh, God would never allow an atomic destruction of this earth. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He did not need an atomic weapon. He right. used his own nature to accomplish this. this so I take it to, to that from this that you don't, uh, you don't fear nuclear war or anything of that nature? There will never be a nuclear war on this earth. There may be a small uh, explosion to frighten people, but never will there be a nuclear explosion. It is not written in God's word. We are near enough in prophecy now that uh, you can rest assured there shall be no nuclear destruction. Now that is not to say that we should destroy ours. Right. Because um, playing politics against communism is a dangerous business unless you've got the biggest rock. Yeah. So okay. I offend some, I'm sure, in saying that, but be that as it may. Is Antichrist alive today? Antichrist is Satan. He's alive and very well. He's at the throne of God, and the only God is allowing him to stay there. He operates uh, Satan uh, adversary, the same as uh, he, he was an adversary against Job. He makes it very difficult today on God's elect. Mm -hmm. and, um, so, so you don't see Antichrist like... Really, most evangelicals see him. You, you, are, you are looking for Satan himself, not necessarily a man who turns against his, uh, what is it, his forefathers' uh, right. religion, so to speak, or anything, or any, any of the attributes that are given this by is evangelicals. Why, right. Excuse me. This is why it is written apostasy. They shall all give up their professed belief in one day, one instant. Mm -hmm. They are thinking and concentrating on man. And they're going to see that that is supernatural, and they're not mentally prepared for it. Mm -hmm. Is that my word? No, it is not. Paul made it very clear in Second Thessalonians that that man of sin, that son of perdition, 
which in the Greek is not perdition, it is a palia, it's one of the base roots for Satan, mm -hmm. will appear in Jerusalem, showing the world that he's God. So really, from God's word, there's no great mystery as to what he shall do. It is written in Revelation 13, the entire chapter explains the seven-year period. The political beast arises first, three and a half years, uh, which has been shortened, incidentally. We will go into one-worldism. We are much closer to one-worldism today than most people realize. It would frighten them if they really knew, I think. Right. However, for, to know the truth, there's nothing frightening about it. It is God's plan. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, shall this one in chapter 13, verse 11, appear having horns, looking like a lamb, looking like Jesus. Hmm. But he has the voice of the dragon because he is the dragon. Now, you said he will look like the Lord uh, or Jesus Christ. What, what will Satan look like? Satan will be, he was the most beautiful all of, the angel, of all the angels. It's documented, or cherubims. He was not an angel, a cherubim. Uh, as is documented in Ezekiel chapter 28. Mm -hmm. And God created him that way. He was the protecting cherub of the mercy seat, which has uh, a messiah connotation. He decided he wanted the seat. Mm -hmm. And pride within his own self. You see, Ray, there's one thing God cannot and will not do. This isn't taught. God cannot force an entity to love him. Love must generate within each entity. Or it's fake. Mm -hmm. Of course, God could say, you will always love me and you got a zombie. Love you, Lord. Love right. you, Lord. He wants the real thing. And that's something he can't force his children to do. That's why that the world that was was destroyed. That is to say, Tuhu Vabuhu was not created void and without form, but he destroyed it. Mm -hmm. To give his children an opportunity to love him from within, born innocent of woman, and uh, that opportunity. But he is described, to get back to the point, in that 28th chapter of Ezekiel as the most beautiful of all the archangels. And he's coming to this earth in that same beauty. His appearance has not changed. It has not been altered. But inside, he is black and full of dead men's bones because he will deceive many people. Christ himself states that he will be able to perform miracles in the sight of. That means visible on earth in sight of man and all and will cause all then to join the one world system. But you, you, see, you see that uh, evangelical believers uh, are going to fall for this, for this devil, for, the, for Satan and be tricked into thinking that this is the rapture and he's going to be gathering all the believers unto him. This is why Jesus said after explaining this, many are going to come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, I healed in your name and I cast out devils. Sure, they did in his name. And it was well and good until Antichrist stepped foot on earth. Mm -hmm. And they had through traditions of men taught a doctrine that does not agree with Christ's doctrine. Mm -hmm. And he's going to say, get out of here. I don't even know you. And it's going to be a sad day, Ray. My heart bleeds for them. Mm -hmm. And they need... The evangelist is... It's beautiful at the work they do. And, and I certainly would single no one out. It's just a fact. Yeah. They don't go into the meat. And it's not their position to. It's the teacher's fault mm -hmm. for not following up and getting into the homework. As Christ said when he groaned, have you not read? I told you long ago how it was going to be. Mm -hmm. Why is it that they are so deceived? Do you feel that people fold into what is commonly known as the blessed hope or the imminent soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ with the rapture uh, prior to the start of the tribulation period? Do you feel that these Christians are lost? No, they're not lost. All that have passed on to the Father have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, but Ray, they were worshiping Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. When Antichrist appears on the scene, though... Okay, at that time, at if, that they're, time if they're deceived... Right, that's what the apostasy means, instantly. Mm -hmm. Now, there is no way that any minister, before the fact, can declare, uh, other than it is as we're doing now, but after Antichrist appears, it will be too late. Mm -hmm. Or they will believe him over any evangelist, over any teacher, because he is supernatural, which means more natural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When a man can produce miracles and signs, our people will follow 
anyone, especially if they say, I'm God, I'm, I'm the way. Mm -hmm. And if they worship that person as Christ, then they will lose their salvation. No. Okay. They will not lose their salvation. God. You see, Ray, it's a beautiful thing. In the, the 11th chapter of Romans, God stated, I send this stupor upon them and because they believe the lie. Mm -hmm. But you see, any sin created in ignorance, which I use, I like, I'm thinking in Greek now, all right? Sure. It means not to know, all right? Not knowing, then there is no sin. And that's what the millennium is about. When they're praying and crying for the mountains to fall upon them because they brought so many to God, saved so many souls. You see, man cannot save souls. Right. To realize they led their entire flock down that lane to Satan's feet. That's why they're, they don't, they don't even, they're so ashamed mm -hmm. because they love the Lord. They're honest in their work and they're, they do not re realize. But God himself oft times sends the slumber. In the Greek, it's stupor, and that's the way you see them. They're in a stupor concerning this. They must have a rapture that is written by man approximately 150 years ago, and where God's word will not document it. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it can be written in if you take one here and a line there, but to read it as Christ taught it. He didn't say, maybe Antichrist is coming. What are these elect doing? that uh, are here and he's afraid they're going to be deceived or he's not really afraid of it if they were not present you mm. see why does God train teachers or his best followers it is to defeat Satan mm -hmm. very interesting uh, we just have a couple minutes left and I, um, I just want to know what if someone is tuned in on this program and they're saying yeah I, I, I kind of get an idea of what, what uh, Pastor Murray is trying to say However, I belong to a church. I have uh, believed all my life in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I've always cast off all, all uh, fear of the future or of making a mistake regarding who Christ will be because I will be raptured uh, to meet him in the sky. What, is your, what, what would you say they should do? On an immediate they should basis? study God's word. As Jesus said, it is written, Antichrist shall come first. It is written, so it's wonderful to fellowship at the church, but you study God's word, because the church will not be standing between you and he on that day of judgment, or will not be standing between you and he on that first day of the millennium if you wake up and realize you were deceived. <laughs> now, you do believe in the millennium, the thousand-year reign oh, absolutely. of Christ. Yes, God loves his children. Mm -hmm. This is just a time of correction. Okay. There's what happens after the thousand years? At the end of the thousand years, uh, there shall be a pit. Satan, after he's released a short season, and those that are taught, those that were deceived by him. Mm -hmm. This is why it's written in Isaiah 14. They walk by the pit and say, is this the man that mm -hmm. deceived the world? You see, it's not a small thing. The entire world. When he's released, after they know full well the truth, that's why it is written in that last verses of the 20th chapter of Revelation, which is the millennium age, that they're judged by works only. Okay. Because they have seen it, Christ. They have heard it from Christ. And if they fall then, if they follow him, that's it. That's it. Okay, our time is up for this particular segment. We're going to take a break right now. My guest tonight on Amazing Grace is Dr. Arnold Murray. And he is from the Shepherd's Chapel broadcast, and he's on uh, NCN about an hour a day, Monday through Friday. He has some very, very interesting positions concerning Antichrist, concerning the rapture or the, the lack of a rapture, and the two tribulation periods. What do you think of all this? I'd like your reactions when we come right back from a break. We'll be gone for about a minute, minute and a half, something like that, and then we'll be back and we will open up our telephone lines to take your reaction. And Dr. Murray, thank you for being on our program. It's my pleasure, Ray. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. This is Amazing Grace on the National Christian Network. There's more to follow with Ray Cassis as Amazing Grace continues in a moment. To get the most out of the National Christian Network, send for our new program schedule. NCN offers a wide variety of programs, many of which are unavailable anywhere else in the country. Scheduling times are sometimes adjusted in response to suggestions from you. And you'll want to keep up with your favorite program. We'll be glad to send you the latest NCN schedule. Simply write 
enclosing a stamp self-addressed envelope. We'll send the schedule by return mail and make sure you're notified of future changes. Write schedule NCN 1150 West King Street, Cocoa, Florida 32922. We very strongly regard NCN as both a service and an outreach and are always eager to find out what you think about our programming, how it serves your needs, and how you think we could be a more effective outreach. We'd like you to get the most out of our ministry, and we'd like to make it interesting to those who are without Christ so that they can learn the good news. When you send for the program schedule, ask for an extra copy, and give that copy to a friend or relative who needs a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Send for your program schedule today. Simply write, Schedule, NCN, 1150 West King Street, Cocoa, Florida, 32922. Ray Cass is back on Amazing Grace. My guest tonight, Dr. Arnold Murray from the Shepherd's Chapel broadcast. We've been talking about uh, Dr. Murray's uh, position on the rapture or the lack of a rapture and the deception that many believers will go through and uh, also his various other positions and since Dr. Murray is on the air with us each day for an hour two half hour broadcasts if you have any other questions about his teaching we welcome your, co your comments and your reactions and your questions now we have a toll free number if you just call that number and let it ring we will answer it and take your calls and um, uh, just invite you to participate with us tonight with uh, Dr. Arnold Murray. We're so happy to have him here, even though I think he's quite controversial. Uh, we certainly want to, uh, to get your reaction. Let's go to our lines. Good evening. You're on the air. Oh, hello, Ray. Hello. Uh, we really enjoy your program here. Um, I'm from Lakewood, California. Yes, ma'am. My name is Esther. Yes, Esther. Uh, I would like to say that Yes, it is true that the Antichrist will come uh, before Christ has put on the Mount of Olives, but that doesn't... Uh, I'm nervous. Well, take your time. We'll... we'll uh... Uh, that doesn't preclude the fact that he's coming in the air uh, for uh, the church. And also, I would like for him to discuss his... Uh, Serpent Seed Doctrine, and uh, also the uh, Ten Tribes. Okay, now that, you brought up a good subject there. I, you know, I meant to ask him about that, but this particular one we started with is so fascinating. In fact, I want to have Dr. Murray back because he's got so many areas that are that are different. But uh, let's see if we, could, um, if we can get your reaction, Dr. Murray, to our caller on the line. This is very true, uh, that... Um, it does not preclude, and there will be a gathering back to Christ. We have no problem with that. Uh, but uh, as you state, that will be after Antichrist appears. The dual seed line. Many people find this more controversial, perhaps, than all uh, of God's controversies. God is not the author of confusion. It is only man that creates the confusion or, if you would, the controversy because of not understanding the fullness of the plan. It is very uh, obvious to the scholar that there are two genealogies, even in the twins, that is to say Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain's genealogy is listed in Genesis chapter 4 separate from Adam's genealogy, which is listed in Genesis chapter 5. Why are they separate? Because they are, ver they are diverse seeds. Jesus made it very clear that Cain was of his father, whether you wish to take it literal or whether you wish to take it spiritual, it, 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 it have whatsoever. But Jesus made it very clear in St. John chapter 8, verse 44, that Cain's sons were of their father, the devil and that his deeds they would do. Now, the genealogy to the Hebrew scholar does not stop in the book of Genesis chapter 4. It continues on in 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse uh, 55. Um, and in that second chapter of 1 Chronicles, verse 55, in the Hebrew, it is Kenite, K-E-N-I-T-E, which means sons of Cain. 
Yes, they made it through the flood, but that would be another subject that would be very difficult to uh, handle on this program. You'll but have it, to come back and really uh, open that up for us, because that I know that's a that's a, that is really different from a lot of from most evangelicals. Yes, it it is indeed different. Mm -hmm. The last part of the question on ten tribe Israel. It is taught by most that God lost ten tribes of his chosen. Now, this is very difficult to understand. God did not lose them. It is that they lost their own identity for a very simple reason. They will not study God's word. They do not dig into the truth, nor do they study history. It's very simple to trace those ten tribes as they migrated. It is God's elect. It is his... Uh, people that must accomplish these things of prophecy in these end times. Not that it makes them any better than anyone else or gives them any rank or figure. For it is not only the children of Israel that God is dealing with. As it is written in Revelation chapter 21, that in that eternal age, here we see the temple with the sons and daughters, all tribes gathered back, all 12 of them. And then who is this we see coming in the distance? We see the kings and the queens of the ethnos, uh, which means any people other than the sons of Isaac. That could be any, most people feel, uh, many people think that Anglo is or the only thing that creates Israel. It's not true. Because Abraham had millions of sons before, if you would, that Isaac uh, was uh, born. And they had offspring also, and they looked the same. In Isaac is the seed called. But we see then, if you would, that God is dealing with all peoples and raising up kings, it is written in the English, and at that time, for after the resurrection, there will be no such thing as male or female, no giving or taking in marriage. It will be kings. But God not only is touching the elect of Israel, but the elect of all peoples and asking these to stand up and be counted against Satan when he appears on this earth very soon and, he, and earn that reward of being a leader of their people. Never apologize for your people, whether it's Israel, Judah, whoever. You be proud, for God created all, and he loves all. Well, he took a brief time to answer these very difficult questions. I appreciate your call tonight. Thank you. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Bye-bye now. Good evening. You're on the air. Yes, good evening, uh, Ray. Uh, we certainly want to thank you for your nice program tonight, and really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Where are you calling from, sir? Uh, Minnesota. From Minnesota. And uh, we have been studying under Dr. Murray for a short time, and we just, my wife and I just think he's fantastic and has a lot of truth, and we just can't say enough good things about him. Good. Have you written to him and let him know that you're watching? <laughs> Uh, oh, yes, I'm sure he knows I'm watching. Okay. We'd just like to see, maybe he should tell the people how they can tell the difference between the two Christs. Uh, the oh, second one. why didn't I think of that? What about the three difference between the Antichrist and the Lord Christ? Very good. Thank you first for your comments and enjoying our study and the teachings. Appreciate that very much. How can you tell the two Christs apart? It's very simple. When the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it be in rapture, if you must hang on to that term, or, or simply a gathering in him. What happens at that moment, at that seventh trump? It is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. All, A-L-L, -L, all, sinner, saint, everyone, even the Kenite, that other, that other seed, changed instantly into that new body. So as long as a Messiah appears in Jerusalem and you're still in the flesh, I use a term perhaps that oversimplifies it simply to say, pinch yourself and if it hurts, it's not him. It's not the true Christ. It's a deceiver that through supernatural ability will be able to cre create a delusion that will deceive many. Okay? Thank you very much for calling tonight. Yes, uh, one other thing I might say, and when talking to my Christian friends, uh, you know, they all believe that they are the elect. And yet, as we read about the tribulation time of the Antichrist in Matthew 24, it says that if it were possible, he's even going to fool the very elect, so they certainly have to be here on the earth when he comes. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So, thank you again. We really, really appreciate it, and are really are enjoying it, and have him back as soon as possible. We'll do it. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye Thank now. you for your call. Good evening. You're on the air. Uh, Ray, I'm Bert Maxson from Indy Landing. 
Yes. I want to thank you for finally inviting the doctor over here. Well, he's been invited. This is the first time his schedule I will permit. I'll be here all week. Uh, I'd like to ask the doctor a question. In uh, Ezekiel, I believe, um, uh, it, it, it uh, talks about five months in the rapture, doesn't it, before we're, uh, before we're raptured out? Uh, we go about five months into the tribulation before we're raptured out? Yes, that is correct. The five months is stipulated in the book of Revelation, chapter 9, concerning the time of the locust. I might add a footnote onto that. This is the reign of Apollyon. You'll read it. His name in the Greek is Apollyon. Um, and uh, if you turn to the 17th chapter of Revelation, you find that this Antichrist, this son of perdition, reigns with the ten rulers, the one world system, ten rulers that shall be appointed to form uh, that one world system shall rule one hour with him. In other words, you must realize that one worldism will not become a complete reality until Antichrist appears. Oh. Then we find that one hour was short, was is symbolic of a five month reign in the ninth chapter of Revelation. So five months is quite a time. We know that God shortened it. We don't know exactly how much, but at least that's a good figure to take into consideration in as much as it is from God's Word. Well, thank you, Dr. Very much. I'm not ready. I hope you keep him over this week. <laughs> well, he's got to go back to services, but uh, we'll, we'll have him back as soon as he possibly can make it. I'm sure glad you got him. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Thank, thank you, sir. You. Good evening. You're on the air. Uh, yes. <clears throat> My question is about Hebrews 13, 14. Yes. And where are you going to come, sir? Well, here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city which is to come. Um, where he, it says here um, we're supposed to seek the city which is to come, it seems like a lot of Christians, we, we live as though we're trying to make the kingdom of, of heaven here. And instead of living as though we're in tents, as though we're in a camp, as though we're just passing through, living here temporarily, mm -hmm. can you shed a little light on that? Mm -hmm. where, where are you calling from, sir? Um, Washington, D.C. Okay. What about that, Dr. Murray? Well, uh, actually, uh, I'm not quite sure that I follow his point. I feel that if anyone believes that they can find heaven on earth, you can find rest in Christ. But there will be tribulation up to that time in the flesh. Uh, it is, it's mentioned in Mark that if you believe on him, you will have, uh, if you give up many things of the world, he will replace them with better, even here, but you will still have persecution. Yes, I think it is wrong for anyone to teach that you can come into a heaven on earth, for heaven will not be on earth. Uh, heaven is wherever the Godhead is, and until the Godhead returns, there will be no heaven on earth. I agree with you in that. Okay? Yes, well, um, it, it seems like everyone is, is pointing towards, they, they, they're always asking for money to build this, or they want money for this school to build a new building here, and, you know, it just seems like a lot of emphasis is, is placed on, on this life to me, as opposed to, you know, like I said, just living in tents and, you know, sacrificing a lot, and um, it, it seems like the world looks at it as, as hypocrisy because every time, you know, like when they come on TV or whatever, they're, they're always asking for money and, and it, you know, it seems like they're selling things. You know, like I was wondering if that had anything to do with uh, when Jesus drove those people out of the temple, you know, the way everybody, they said, you know, you can get saved and then send them some money for a book or instead of it being free or whatever, I don't know. I, I think you have a good point. I, did you want to comment on that? Uh, I, I think he has a good point. I certainly do. And incidentally, we, within two or three days, we'll be covering that Christ driving uh, the money changers out of the temple. If, if I may, I'll let it answer it for you in more depth. Okay. And I agree, by the way, with your with your uh, with your observation of, uh, of folks today uh, making merchandise of the gospel, and I think that's uh, that's a sad uh, state of affairs for Christian television broadcasting. I can very easily tell you, though, that this network has never raised one dime uh, from our viewing audience. We have never asked for funds, and this program has never asked for funds. So you can't say all and they all. There are quite a few programmers that do not, and we're proud to have some of them on the air with us. So thank you for calling. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Good evening. You're on the air. 
Good evening, Ray. Yes. It's uh, super that you've got that fine gentleman on tonight who I believe is the most outstanding teacher that I've ever listened to in the history of my life. Great. And I'd like to pose a couple of questions to uh, to Arnold Murray. Sure. Where are you calling from, sir? Uh, Chaska, Minnesota. Okay. Welcome. The hey. first one I would like to ask, Ray, is in Matthew, the 15th chapter, verse 24. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, that would be number one. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go on from there back to John, John 3, where Jesus talked to Nicodemus. And I know Nicodemus' background, and I can understand why Jesus told him he must be born again. But I'd like Arnold to address that topic as it relates to uh, uh, the basic Christians about, okay? All right. Let's, uh, let's try him on and see how he does. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Thank you very much for those comments. Let's take the uh, Matthew 15, if we may, concerning going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Christ taught his disciples what they should teach, and he sent them forth, and this was his instructions, because the law was only to Israel until Messiah, that is to say Jesus, paid the price on the cross. In other words, um, salvation had not opened to the world. And this was his meaning within this, is go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and teach. Now, uh, we know that in God's elect, we have free will and election. And this covers uh, um, uh, probably more ground than we dare get into this night. But election and free will have nothing to do with status. It does have something to do with duties in these end times. And he is calling many forth for that. Uh, and um, one must be born again, but they must be born again into the true knowledge as well as into, into Christ. To be born again of body, we would be talking about reincarnation. But to be born, reborn into the full truth and knowledge that all had at one time. And uh, I'm talking about, if you would, in that time in the world that was. Uh, of course, this is why there is election, because they were predestined. They earned the right at the first rebellion to be used and called in these end times. God will interfere nor intercede without request in the life of anyone that has free will, because it is paramount that they make their mind that he or she loves God freely and openly. And I appreciate your questions. Thank you for calling tonight, sir. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye now. Good evening. You're on the air. Good evening. I'm calling from Melbourne. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question for uh, Dr. Murray. Uh, would he please continue his thoughts about uh, what happens after the end of the tribulation? Okay. What happens at the end of the tribulation? I'm going to assume that you are speaking of the tribulation of the Antichrist, which would be the sixth seal. All right. Then we have the seventh seal. We God focuses up close, up tight, or in tight, rather, on this in the 38th and the 39th chapters of Ezekiel. For indeed, when God, um, in the 15th chapter of Revelation, closed the temple doors in heaven, meaning from that point forward, they were going through. No one would be received in heaven until that uh, Antichrist reign was over with and it had, it had run its course and the Godhead, that is to say, Christ, returned. So then comes the second tribulation, which is that great day that is written of. That is God's tribulation when he shall pour his wrath out upon his enemies. And, of course, what happens at that time? Many people think negative thoughts, negative thoughts. No, God has the negative part to his plan because they must be corrected. In the instant that God begins to rail, rain rather those hailstones down, upon those enemies at that moment, instantly they are changed into the spiritual body and go into that time of teaching anyway. God never thought even in his mind about Moloch practice. That means burning anyone alive. Uh, he loves his children. But the lesson must be learned well this time to not be deceived by Satan as they were in the world that was. They must learn their lesson well this time. That's why he will use Fire, hail, and brimstone. But that word fire, 
Hebrews chapter thir- uh, chapter 12, last verse states, God is a consuming fire. That fire, to one that loves him, is that warmth of the Holy Spirit you feel in your heart that glows and, and uh, gives you his presence. Uh, but to someone in Satan's camp, that fire will destroy all lies. Uh, so I, I hope that helps you uh, with your uh, question. God loves his children, and he will care for them. Uh, thank you. I just have one other question. Would you also please continue your thoughts about what will happen at the end of the millennium? Okay. Oh, okay. I, I, I mentioned there would be a lake of fire, right? And that Satan and those that follow him would go into that lake of fire. That's the last day of the millennium. We're about to enter into the eternity. We pick this up in Revelation chapter 21, where in the Greek it states, God rejuvenates the earth, not renews or makes new. He rejuvenates or renews this terra firma that we now stand upon. Peter made it very clear in 2 Peter chapter 3 that there were three world ages. Man puts blinders on and can only think of himself in the flesh. If you look at the world that was, then you can understand predestination. We, on that day, step into, if you would, the first day of the eternity. But when the earth is rejuvenated, what happens to hell? What happens to this pit? For we learn, after the earth is renewed... There's never anything that causes a tear, that would cause an offense, but the world, all water is turned to earth, if you would, and the temple is rebuilt, the eternal temple, and all are happy. So I cannot uh, understand why some Christians like to teach that here is the throne, and there is the pit. God's going to take his pitchfork, the one Satan's supposed to have, throw them all into that pit, and then he's going to free us, and we're going to stand before the temple and listen to these poor people scream for an eternity. Uh, I I dread pain. Uh, I adore pain. And I don't think that's God's idea of heaven. So there will be a total renewing. Many might say, well, they burn forever and ever. That is a Hebrew idiom pulled from the 28th chapter of Ezekiel where Satan, called Tyre there, Tyre in the Hebrew tongue means rock. He is not our rock. Our rock is God. Our rock is Jesus Christ. Uh, so all that believe upon that false rock will, and at the end of that millennium age will depart with him. But it means to destroy himself from within by fire, turn to ashes. You can read it for yourself in that 28th chapter of Ezekiel. Turn to ashes is a Hebrew idiom meaning thinni, no more, never again. So, uh, which is forever and ever. When you burn to ashes and turn to ashes and it's destroyed. But the earth as we know it will be uh, destroyed. Yes. No, no, no. No, the earth age will be destroyed. That is simply this age. But the terra firma, the arats in the Hebrew, shall be renewed. Okay? God built this earth whereby if man would have left it alone, it would replenish itself for an eternity. But man comes along and pollutes and pollutes and pollutes. Probably when man's flesh body is converted, if you would, to that spiritual body in the millennium and then on into the eternity, the human body is the greatest pollutant that was ever placed upon earth. When it's gone, earth will renew because man destroys. God does not. Thank you very much. Thank you for your call tonight, sir. Bye-bye. Good evening. You're on the air. Yes, uh, I'm calling from Arkansas. Yes, sir. And uh, I used to consider myself a Gentile, but now I know I believe I am of Israel. But I was wondering, uh, where did the Gentiles, such as your uh, black race and your uh, yellow race, originate from other than uh, Adam or Abraham? Okay, good question. Dr. Murray? God created all men and he looked upon all men and it was good God created one man on the sixth day and he gave that man charge and dominion over all animals he was a hunter and many of the people are involved in this God created another man in in Genesis chapter 1 verse 20 stating I took minerals the same minerals he took clay from the soil but from the sea 
And of course, in the English, it says made a fish or is commonly taught that way, but he gave it a soul. You don't give a fish a soul. And uh, we have all the peoples of the earth. It should never be turned into, uh, you know, racism. And uh, if we're not careful, that's what we're knocking at the door at. God would abhor this. He was pleased and proud of every one that he created. He simply created Adam on the eighth day because he looked around and he didn't have a man to tend the garden. And he was created and put over the domestic animals, etc. God is well pleased with all that he has ever created. Um, it does not matter in these final years. I don't care what race you are. You be proud of your people. God loves you. There is no second-class citizen in the eternity when it's coming. I might even say that some of the nations, as it is written in uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse, I think it's 24, the nations that their kings come to God, they shall even have a king and or, or queen. And God is calling people out from all races to understand Antichrist is appearing. Of course, the elect of Israel have specific things made by covenant and contract. How can we know that we are God's elect? Or how can we know that we are one of these kings and queens that have ears to hear? God stated in Romans chapter 11, I have set aside 7,000 that will not bow a knee to Baal, meaning Antichrist. And the others I have set, sent the spirit of stupor upon them. If you, my dear friend, whoever you are, if you have eyes to see and know that Antichrist is coming soon to deceive the world, then you are one among your people of few that are able to see the truth. God has blinded the others, not because he hates them, but because he does not want them to be accountable for what they might do when Antichrist appeared, because that would be the unforgivable sin. Many wonder, well, what is this unforgivable sin? It's to deny the Holy Ghost an opportunity to speak through you. That is to say, deny the Holy Spirit. What am I talking about? All elect of the kings and queens and elect, when they are delivered up before the synagogues of Satan, they are not to premeditate what they shall say beforehand. You don't have to worry about being a great Hebrew or, or Greek or Chaldean scholar, as long as you know the truth, where you're at, where you stand. But he will speak through those elect, and the truth will go out to the world, for Satan will be televising, that is to say, Antichrist, these trials. What will he be saying to them, standing there with his pitchfork, ready to throw them in the fire as they paint God? No, he'll be saying, come unto me, little children. <clears throat> Excuse me. I love you. Okay? We're running out of time for this particular hour. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Dr. Murray, we have a lot of calls on the line, and would you like to stay and do another hour with us? Be happy to, Ray. Okay. For some of our stations, we're going to be leaving right now, but for those of you that are watching this program live, we're going to return right back with a second hour. If you'll continue to call, now keep on the lines. If you're calling the 800 number, let the phone ring until we answer it. This is Amazing Grace from the National Christian Network, and Dr. Murray, thank you again for being our, our guest. Uh, as we conclude this hour, our lines are very, very full. If you folks keep calling, we'll stay on for an additional hour. And uh, again, for many of our stations, we will have to leave you, but for those of you watching live, we'll be right back right after this word. This is Ray Cassis on Amazing Grace. Tonight, Dr. Arnold Murray from the Shepherd's Chapel television broadcast, seen twice daily here on the National Christian Network. We'll be right back.